uh, welcome to uh, our presentation of Outlook 2021, Powering Forward. I'm Joey Perkins. I'm a partner with both Cannon Company, our CPA firm, and Cannon Wealth Management. We're very excited to have you take a few minutes out of your day and spend with us. Uh, I know you're going to hear a lot of uh, important information, and, and my hope is that maybe we'll ease some of your concerns uh, about the upcoming year. I know a lot of people are uneasy right now, and, and our hope is that we'll present some information that, that maybe will help some of those concerns. You know, we normally have this presentation uh, in person at Maple Chase Country Club, and uh, well, this year's different. You know, we're, we're all sitting here, we're in front of our computer screens, and uh, no surprise, you know, 2021 is starting off a lot like 2020 ended. Uh, but, uh, but with that, you know, at least we are together uh, in spirit and uh, virtually, and uh, we're going to power through this, uh, this Outlook presentation and uh, provide you with a platform uh, to start 2020, 2021 in a position, uh, put you in a position to make informed decisions in your financial world, and we're excited to be here. Um, with that, we're going to start this presentation in much the same manner as we start our live presentations. I want to turn things over to someone that I look to for advice, uh, not only in my financial life, but also in my personal life. One of the most insightful and thoughtful people that I know. Uh, I'd like you to welcome Barry Amber uh, here to uh, open us up with a few comments and an opening prayer. Barry, take it away. So for those of you that know me, uh, you may wonder who Joey was talking about. Uh, thank you, Joey, for that glowing introduction. I appreciate it. To everyone out there joining us tonight, thank you for taking some of your time. There are a lot of things you could be doing. Uh, you could be binge watching Bridgerton or uh, Yellowstone or something like that, but you've chose to spend your time with us tonight, and I appreciate that. As Joey alluded to, we're in a very uncertain world right now. Uh, so many things causing us angst and anguish. COVID is in its throes. We just passed the 400,000 death milestone in the United States, an unprecedented figure that they are suggesting may go to 500,000 by the end of February. Uh, on January the 6th, we experienced civil unrest in Washington, uh, an invasion of the Capitol that we had never seen since uh, the British invaded and burned Washington back in the War of 1812. Uh, just an unprecedented time. We, tomorrow we will be experiencing a change in government when President-elect Biden will become President Biden and President Trump will become former President Trump. Um, lots of things changing. So we plan. In addition to having uncertainty in our world, we have uncertainty in our life. This past Wednesday, uh, went into the office expecting a very normal day. Uh, about 10 o'clock, one of my associates, my right hand in the King office, Mike Easter, uh, went to the restroom and never came out. He had a heart attack and died. Uh, that's uncertainty at its utmost. In 2014, I went to see the doctor and he gave me a diagnosis of cancer. Uh, again, something that very uncertain, pointed out how fleeting this life is and how fragile it is. And finally, employment uncertainty. So many people are losing jobs because of businesses that are closing during the, during the COVID uh, quarantine that we're in now. It just, in my mind, cements the necessity of planning, uh, a topic near and dear to my heart. Uh, I try to look far down the road and figure out what's coming and how can I best prepare my clients, my family, my colleagues for what I believe is coming down the road. A number of different ways. Uh, risk mitigation is a big part of my planning structure. And all that means is trying to figure out things that can come that can Drag, drag your plans off the rails, and how do we, how do we deal with that? Um, excuse me. The other part is estate documents, the planning for, planning for end of life issues, planning for having a will so that you can control how your assets are passed to the next generation. 
Um, my father died in 2009. And while he had a will, he did not have an advanced directive. So when he had a stroke and was put on the ventilator, uh, my mother had to make the decision as to whether to pull the, whether to pull the uh, ventilator from him and lose his ability to breathe. Tough situation, terrible situation. Uh, things that can be not prevented, but can be mitigated with good planning. But now our planning is very much limited. Uh, I take my cues from the Bible. Uh, I look to God for my inspiration and for my guidance. And out of the Bible come a couple of things that are guiding principles for me. And one is that God has plans for our lives and we need to follow those plans. We need to obey his leading. But finally, the last thing is God, man proposes, but God disposes. The end's finally in his hands, but that does not lessen the need for us to plan. So with those thoughts in mind, I'd like to open us with prayer, if I might. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a chance to gather together tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the ability to come together virtually. It's not quite as much fun as when we come together socially and share laughs and share food. And But this is where we are, and this is where you put us. COVID did not take you by surprise. The civil unrest did not take you by surprise. Nothing takes you by surprise. And we thank you, Lord, that you have plans for us. Guide us, Lord, in our human plans that we can properly use the gifts that you have given us, our gifts of finances and also our gifts of mental talent to properly serve you and put us in a position to serve others as well. I pray these things and all things, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you very much for those uh, thoughts and perspectives. I, we appreciate that. Uh, before we get to our presentation, just a couple of housekeeping keep, items. Uh, first of all, there is a Q&A tab uh, somewhere on your, your screen. Uh, different uh, interfaces will have different spots for those, I suppose. But somewhere on your screen, there's a Q&A tab. And if you've got a question during the presentation, Click that tab, enter your, enter your question. At the end of the presentation, we will uh, get to as many of those as we can. Uh, if we should uh, not happen to get to yours, um, if you'd please include maybe an email address uh, with your question and we'll respond to you via email with an answer to it. Uh, additionally, uh, also our presenters are going to use a lot of graphs and charts. If you've been to one of our uh, Outlook presentations before, you'll know there's a lot of graphs and charts um, involved here. Um, so we've uh, included a PDF copy of the slides uh, in the chat tab. There's a link there that Kimberly's placed for you. Uh, so you can go there, grab that document for your uh, future perusal and enjoyment. Uh, if, you got any, if you have any trouble grabbing that document, let us know and we'll, we'll get you a copy of that as well. So with that, and without any further ado, I want to uh, get to the main event and introduce our speakers. Uh, Matt Hearn, somebody that uh, a lot of you already know, I would imagine but he's someone I work closely with on a daily basis. Uh, I, I really enjoy introducing clients to him. Uh, he's, his caring and his concern for their financial well-being is beyond anything that I've seen. Uh, and uh, in four years of working closely with him, I, I enjoy each and every day uh, of working with him. And Chip Wilcox, our newest uh, partner with Cannon Wealth and financial advisor. Uh, we're all very excited to have uh, Chip on board with us and Again, he is someone, his knowledge and attention to detail is, is beyond most anybody that I've seen in the financial industry. I know you're going to appreciate and enjoy their presentation. Uh, so with that, guys, Matt, Chip, take it away, boys. Uh, thank you, Joey. Appreciate your uh, introduction there and appreciate each one of you being with us. Um, I know that there is a lot of competing things on uh, Netflix or Hulu that you could be watching. So thank you for being with us. We'll try to keep this entertaining or at least at least somewhat interesting. Try not to put you to sleep tonight. So um, I just want to quickly mention Joey and I have had the privilege of working together now for, for about four years pretty closely. Of course, I enjoy all the 
opportunities to work with the accountants and, and financial planners at, uh, at Canon. But uh, Joey, Joey, it does a, um, you know, he's getting ready to go into tax season and uh, he's, he's the first one here. Uh, you know, uh, I see his car here at early in the morning and he's one of the last ones to leave. And so I, I know his dedication to, to working with clients and helping them through this. Uh, these, the, the, you know, the, the two things that are certain, right? Death and taxes. So uh, <laughs> uh, Joey uh, is, a, is a good one and, and I appreciate the opportunity to work with you, sir. Um, and um, so, yeah, let's dive in. Uh, tonight's presentation is called Outlook 2021 Powering Forward. I'm going to go ahead and share the sc my screen with you. So I'll do that now. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to see the slides. All right. <clears throat> go ahead and uh, all right, good. So uh, and, and so uh, this is Outlook 2021 Powering Forward. Powering Forward is, uh, I think, a good title for this year, given the challenges, the extraordinary challenges we've had in 2020. Uh, now in 2021, it's time to restart our engines, uh, but things are going to look different, feel different. 2020 has changed really all of us in one way or another. Uh, the way we do business, the way we connect with one another, uh, in Outlook 2021, powering forward, we're going to talk about stocks, we're going to talk about bonds, we're going to talk about the economy, talk, talk about the post-election policy environment. But in the background will be new challenges, new opportunities, and new ways of doing things. So we're going to be, begin tonight by discussing a new course uh, and of course, with the, uh, the new economic policy coming out of Washington, that's one of the most common questions that we're getting right now. And uh, you'll notice on the screen there, don't fear a blue wave. Uh, certainly, some are excited, some are uh, not so excited. Uh, but uh, whether, regardless of who is uh, in Washington and, and, of course, with the, Gen the Georgia Senate, elections behind us, the Democrats uh, will soon control both chambers of Congress along with the presidency. Uh, historically, blue waves like this haven't been bad for stocks. In fact, the S&P 500 index has finished higher six of the past seven times under this scenario, with the only negative year a slight loss in 1994. Sometimes in order to get an idea of where we might be going, it's good to remember where we've been, right? Uh, as you may recall, the U.S. economy uh, back in early 2020 was, was improving. It was improving nicely, uh, but it, there was a, a modest slowdown in the fourth quarter of 2019. And then, as we all recall, uh, it skidded to an abrupt stop in the face of COVID-19. The pandemic ended the longest economic expansion ever, one that lasted more than 10 years. The recession that, that ensued was caused mainly by the government closing businesses and people staying home in response to COVID-19. Once the economy began to open back up again and shift into gear uh, later in 2020, a new economic expansion likely began. I'd like to ask Chip Wilcox, a fellow financial advisor, somebody I've known for, for about eight years now and a and, uh, good friend, uh, and now a partner at Cannon Wealth Management. I'd like to ask you, Chip, to take us into the next part of our presentation. Well, thank you, Matt, and I really appreciate everyone who's joined us today. And I also appreciate my teammates here at Cannon Wealth Management. Uh, when I came on board, it was only a matter of weeks, and I knew I had made the right decision. So I'm so happy to be here, and I'm so happy to be talking about the outlook for 2021. If we look at the slide that's up on the screen and we talk about this chart, we anticipate many more years of growth ahead because we've had record amounts of stimulus, both monetary and fiscal. And we're optimistic about the vaccines that were rolled out here in early 2021. If you note this chart, you'll see that the average length of an economic expansion has been about 5.3 years. Moving to the next slide, some people are calling this a K-shaped recovery. This type of recovery is characterized by certain sectors of the economy improving or pointing higher, while other sectors deteriorate or point lower. 
Many businesses in the service, se service sector are being hampered by COVID-19 restrictions. On the other hand, many companies in the manufacturing sector are moving forward at a record speed. If you view this in relation to workers, there also appears to be a growing gap between the haves and the have-nots. As you can see by the chart on the next slide, LPL expects GDP growth of between four and four and a half percent for 2021. Global growth is expected to slightly outpace our US GDP growth to the tune of about four and a half to five percent. We're looking for emerging markets to potentially lead the charge globally. We think developed nations are likely to lag the US in GDP growth. The key to sustaining this recovery is going to be a robust COVID-19 response and further stimulus. One bright spot from this pandemic is that the accelerated innovation that we've seen because of the COVID-19 response is likely to continue. This chart also shows expectations of low inflation and a desire for the Federal Reserve to keep rates low. Many of us might say that 2020 was one of the most difficult years we've experienced. The worst pandemic in 100 years, a deep recession, a bear market, election uncertainty. But that being said, 2020 was a good year for stocks. Why is that? Well, the markets are forward looking, so stocks were likely looking ahead to 2021. Matt, talk to us a little bit about the forecast for US equity markets, earnings, and the 10 year treasury. Thank you, Chip. Uh, yes, we do think that stocks could do well in 2021. A strong earnings rebound this year may even allow stocks to grow into somewhat elevated valuations. What that basically means is, is we can look at the, the underlying economy of a particular company, uh, look at earnings, look at uh, where they are in their industry, and then look at the stock price and, and see in some cases where there may be an elevated valuation. Cost efficiencies achieved during the pandemic may persist. Uh, so that would be a good thing, we think, for at least for corporate America. Uh, we see an S&P 500 index fair value target range of 3850 to 3900 in 2021, with the potential for upside with better than expected vaccine progress. As the threat of COVID-19 hopefully diminishes and the economy moves uh, toward fully reopening, we anticipate cor corporate America will begin to showcase its much improved earnings potential. One silver lining in the cloud of the COVID-19 pandemic is that it has caused the entire world to look for new ways of doing things, uh, to be forced outside of, of, of its comfort zone, so to speak, and innovation has occurred. Uh, there are so many examples of ways that the pandemic of 2020 drove innovation, and, um, and, and we think, uh, really, we don't have time to do, get into all, all the different ways that we've seen but uh, we do believe that we will continue to see improved efficiencies in our economy and around the world. We estimate $165 earnings per share target for 2021. Transitioning from stocks to bonds, we anticipate the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield will finish 2021 in a range of 1.25 to 1.75 percent, with our bias leaning toward the lower end of this range. Now, historically, the worst economic conditions have been followed by some of the biggest rallies. In 2020, the S&P 500 index was able to fully recover its bear market decline in only six months. Usually, that takes years. In fact, for the first time ever, stocks produced a gain in a calendar year after being down in that same year by more than 30%. <laughs> it's really quite a comeback when you think about it. It's unprecedented. After such a strong rally from the March 2020 lows, it would be logical to think returns going forward may be more muted. In this chart, we look at some of the previous major bear market lows, most recently in March of 2009, and see that stocks tend to add to gains well after that initial surge. Of course, there's no guarantee this will happen in 2021, but historically speaking, stocks have tended to do well in years after uh, years where we've seen a 30% or greater decline. Let's talk for a moment about corporate earnings. Earnings really are the underlying current on which stocks typically ebb and flow. In 2020, as you might imagine, earnings fell sharply due to the lockdowns and, and the recession. Despite the lingering effects of COVID-19, in 2021, we do expect 
economic recovery to drive a big rebound in profits. We potentially could see the S&P 500 earnings growth of 25% or, or greater in 2021, boosted by cost efficiencies achieved during the pandemic. Some of this is already priced into the stock market, but not all of it in our estimation. Turning once again toward the bond market, the economy may be kicking back into gear this year, potentially providing a tailwind for stocks, but the story isn't the same for the investment grade bonds. Um, an improving economy generally leads to higher interest rates. And when rates go up, bond prices go down, weighing on bonds total return. Uh, there will still be opportunity for bond investors in 2021, but it may be a year that requires great, greater patience, lowered expectations, and a more opportunistic approach. Inflationary pressure is likely to be limited, and the Federal Reserve is expected to keep rates low, but economic improvement and even normalizing inflation could put upward pressure on interest rates. Overall, based on our view of rates and the economy, we expect near flat to low single digit returns for the uh, Bloomberg Barclays U.S. Aggregate Bond Index of 2020 in 2021, uh, with some potential for, uh, for you know potential for loss. Uh, Chip, would you like to talk in more detail uh, tonight about the uh, outlook for the bond market? Sure, thank you, Matt. Um, when we think about the ten-year Treasury, uh, that is kind of our baseline for our fixed income view, and we're targeting a yield range between. 1.25 and 1.75 percent for the year end 2021, as we as we saw in a previous slide and in this slide, this expectation should be helped by economic recovery and normalizing inflation, and we are expecting a meaningful increase in yields. Since 1990, we have seen six cases where yields have dropped at least one and a half percent over four calendar quarters. In all six cases, the 10-year Treasury yield was higher a year later by about 90 basis points or a little less than 1%. Moving to the next slide, even though we have low return expectations for high quality bonds, we still believe they continue to play a very important role in your portfolio as a diversifier. As you can see from this chart, there were six stretches where the S&P 500 declined by at least 10% between 2010 and 2020. The US aggregate bond index gained on average during those periods led by treasuries. The takeaway is that core bonds play an important role in a portfolio as a stabilizer when times are difficult in the stock market. Well, folks, that concludes the presentation portion of this broadcast. Now I'd like to turn it over to my partner, Joey Perkins for some Q&A and some closing thoughts. Thank you a lot, Chip. Thank you, Matt. Great job, guys. Uh, I was not lying to you when I said there was a lot of charts and graphs. So there was a <laughs> lot of charts and graphs. Uh, don't forget that you can go and get your copy of that in, with the chat, the chat room or chat tab down there. There's a link for you. Go grab that and, and you know and get all that information. A lot of good information, and uh, we appreciate it. We do have some questions. Uh, when I put my glasses on for these, we do have some questions and. Um, I'll try to pick a few for you guys and, uh, and see if we can stump you. So uh, here we go, moment of truth. Uh, I'll paraphrase this a bit. It says, I am conservative. I'm very nervous about the stock market being so high right now that we may have a market correction. What should I do to protect my savings? Uh, Matt, you want to grab that one? Uh, I'll take a stab at it. <laughs> I do think that's a good question. Uh, certainly, we have a number of our investors who would categorize themselves as conservative. Uh, and, it, and that's a question we're getting a lot of right now. Um, while our outlook is that we will have an average to potentially above average year in the stock market this year, uh, we certainly can only read the data as it's presented. Uh, we didn't foresee COVID-19, uh, for example. And, and often, as we plan and prepare and, and build portfolios, we don't, we don't know the future. Uh, we, don't, we don't foresee everything. Um, but there's some principles that you can follow when you're a conservative investor that I think are important. First, um, do you have an emergency fund? Uh, we, we do think that that's key. Uh, if you have uh, three to six months of living expenses set aside and something that's it's guaranteed, like a, like a checking or savings or even a potentially a CD, 
um, uh, then that can be very helpful as, as a buffer in the event that we go through a downturn in the market. Um, if you're retired, you might even want to have a six to nine month uh, or, or more in, in, in something that is categorized as an emergency fund. Uh, number two, uh, I, would, I would consider having um, high quality bonds in your portfolio, some things that uh, uh, certainly can be a buffer. And we talked about that earlier. Uh, two, two ways that can help you. First, um, you know, if you're pulling money out of your portfolio, you can, in a downturn, you can take money from the bond portion and, and avoid having to sell uh, stocks when they are down in, in value. Another way that can help you is, is sometimes you can even take some money from your bond portion and, and shift and buy stocks at a better price in a downturn. So it can help you in rebalancing to have a, a portion of your portfolio in high quality bonds. Um, and then, and then I guess just the just the truth of keeping your eye on the horizon. Uh, if I'm a conservative investor, but I, I know I need to be to have some money in the market, uh, I think I would uh, just encourage myself as well as everybody I talk to 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 look at the long term. Uh, when when we think about how markets go down, uh, historically they always come back up, uh, and can guarantee that, of course. Uh, past performance is not a guarantee of the future, but, um, but historically, uh, fear tends to subside eventually, and uh, the fundamentals, the truth of, of the fact of the, that these companies are still in business, that they're still making money, um, comes back to, to light. And, uh, and so keep, keep your eye on the horizon. Uh, those are maybe some things to think about if you're a conservative investor. Thank you, Matt. And I, and I'd say yeah, I'll point these questions to somebody, but if any, you know, Chip, Perry, if you guys want to chime in, yeah, that, that'd be great as well. So I'll, I'll try to pick, I'll pick on somebody, but if you guys want to chime in, that'd be great too. Uh, well, if I could, yeah. If I could, uh, one thing, Matt, you alluded to uh, watching where the money comes from and uh, drawing from bonds first. Uh, another thing to be cognizant of when you're picking where to take the money from, especially for those of you who may be retired, is uh, taxability issues. We're in a, we're currently in the lowest uh, tax environment during my lifetime. So uh, there are some opportunities there for uh, not only investment savvy with withdrawal plans, but also tax savvy withdrawal plans. Uh, in addition to which we do have some downside protection uh, investments at our disposal that uh, require more, would require more of an explanation than we have time for tonight, but we'd certainly uh, be delighted to talk with you further about how we can put some, put some walls around your portfolio, if you will, to some degree. Not all, Barry. I think that's one thing that we at Canon Wealth, Canon and Company, that's one thing we bring to the table is uh, is marrying the, the financial advisory piece and the tax piece. So spot on there. Uh, all right, Chip, here's you one. Uh, okay. Why did stocks recover so quickly in March of 2020? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. And I think the answer is, um, is there was just an enormous amount of uh, stimulus. I mean, you think about the response, it was very rapid from both the Federal Reserve and, um, and we had some fiscal stimulus as well. Um, you know, I think back to 2008 and 2009, and I was a a younger financial advisor at that point. And, um, and I remember that as a very disconcerting time. Um, there was a lot of unknowns and, and, there was, and it was harder to see action. And we were kind of in uncharted territory. I feel like in many ways, the Federal Reserve learned a lot of lessons during that period. And, um, and when they responded, they responded very quickly and did so with a lot of force. I mean, just went into the markets and, um, and made liquidity available. And so I think that really helped uh, just the, the forcefulness of the response and um, having it come from more than one front was the key to seeing uh, stocks rebound. And, and I've never seen anything like it in my life. And 
may never see it again. That was uh, that was an enormously fast uh, downturn and a, and a super fast recovery. So if you blinked, you missed it. But I mean, I feel like it was just lessons learned, and um, and uh, my hats off to the to the folks in 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 Washington and at the Fed for stepping in. If I could, uh, if I could piggyback on top of that, uh, on the drive over here today, I was listening to an interview with uh, Janet Yellen, our, tre- our incoming Secretary of the Treasury, and uh, she is very uh, forceful in her support for the next round of stimulus, for the increase from the $300 stimulus to a $2,000 stimulus, or some variant of that, and if the past is a predictor of the future, we, we could very easily see a similar bump following a new round of stimulus. So just a thought. Very good. Very good. Thank you guys. Um, Jim, here's one more for you. We'll stay in your corner. Okay. Uh, given all this information that's been presented here tonight, uh, Boy, this is a loaded question too, Jeff. Uh, okay. All the information, what should I do with my investments? Well, I think we would all agree that we can't give specific advice to any one person um, uh, over, a, over a broadcast. When we sit down with clients, we're, we're going to look at them uh, one-on-one, uh, try to develop a plan that works for them. So broad investment advice is going to be uh, somewhat difficult to... To, to give, but uh, when we think about a portfolio and how we construct that and, and what are the considerations, we wanna make sure that we're taking into consideration your time horizon, your goals and objectives, your tax situation. Um, you know, these are all really important things and, and, and the risk that you're willing to take is extremely important. So when I think about going into this year and how you should construct your portfolio, you should have some conversations about those items with your financial advisor and come up with a plan. I think one of the, one of the lessons that I learned and, and that I'm still learning even, uh, even coming through 2020 is that the time to have your portfolio ready for good times or bad is before it happens. So you want to have the, a portfolio that you can feel comfortable with on the upside and on the downside going into these events. And that means in some, in some cases, a compromise, giving up a little bit of upside from some, for some protection on the downside and giving up, um, you know, and, and accepting maybe a little bit lower rate of return for being able to sleep a lot better at night. Thank you, Chip, a lot for that. Appreciate Chip, that. Yeah. Um, Chip, that was very insightful. Uh, I'm often reminded that uh, Noah didn't start building the right, building the ark when the rain started. He had the ark well underway before he had the ark built before the first drop fell. So you know it. <laughs> the, thank you, guys. Appreciate that. Got, we'll squeeze in a couple more, maybe here. Uh, this may be timely, um, given what's going on in our in Washington tomorrow. Uh, Matt, you can take this one first. Uh, the new president, soon to be president, uh, has indicated that he will likely raise taxes on from those in the higher tax bracket. I'm worried about what effect that may have on stock prices. Any suggestions on how to prepare for this event? Yeah, that, that is another great question. Um, so, so we get that question a lot, don't we, Joey? I know in meetings we've had with clients, that's a question we, we've heard before. Um, you could probably answer it better than I can. The only thing I can think of just right off the top of my head is that, um, you know, the, the, the history suggests that the stock market is not impacted uh, negatively really at all um, historically. Now, I can't guarantee that for this time, but um, when, when tax rates go up, historically, uh, the stock market uh, continues to, to, we see about the same or even better and I, that may have to do with the fact that when tax rates rise in the, in the past, if you go all the way back to 1950 and look at all the times where, they've, where, where tax rates have gone up, uh, the stock market may be celebrating that, that, that there's getting ready to be some more stimulus because uh, sometimes tax rate hikes and stimulus go hand in hand. 
So, so there's a lot of moving parts in that discussion, but I would say not to fear tax hikes as an investor um, uh, because um, hi history doesn't support the idea that that's going to derail the stock market. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate that. And let's, let's end on this one. Um, with the government borrowing so much money, doesn't it decrease the value of our dollar? Matt, who, or whoever wants to jump in on that one. Yeah. yeah, that's probably number two or three that we get all the time, isn't it? Any yep. of you guys want to, I just answered one. So anybody want to jump in? You, okay. You go ahead, Matt. You, you, you want me to just, okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would just, I would just say, uh, yes. I, 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 I mean, I'm, if you could read the question one more time, if you don't mind, Joey, I, I appreciate that. With the government borrowing so much money, and I guess spending so much at the same time, mm -hmm. um, you know, is there a potential, or what? It, what is the potential impact on the value of our dollar? Yeah, I mean, inflation, absolutely. Um, inflation is the rate at which the value of the dollar decreases, um, or maybe you could say inflation is the rate at which goods and services cost more over time. Um, right now, I'd say over the last year, uh, year over year, um, the most recent number I saw was 1.6% for uh, core inflation. So inflation has not been a big concern uh, for, for the, those that are watching, you know, the Fed in particular, uh, as they watch inflation rate as, as one of their mandates. It's not been a big concern yet. Uh, we did see a pretty big tick upward in December. Um, I believe it was 0.4% is what I saw. So they're going to, you know, we are, that is something we are watching very closely. Um, you know, I, I don't, I'm not fearing inflation yet, but it's something we're watching very closely. I do remember from years and years ago studying this, the two areas uh, of, of the markets or the two investment areas that tend to do really well in high inflation environments are stocks and commodities. So having some money in stocks, having some money in commodities can be a, a protection for you in a higher inflation environment. Great Thank question. You, I appreciate that. Um, I think we've gone beyond our allotted time, which is good because the last part of that was, uh, I think, really informative and hopefully beneficial to those out there. Um, you know, uh, I just want to remind everybody to, to grab that PDF of the slides and also, we've been recording this tonight, so uh, which is scary for us, but uh, we've been recording this, and uh, it'll be available on all of our uh, social media outlets. Uh, you know, we know, Kimberly will post that probably in the coming days. Uh, you know, help us out. You know, give that a, a like, or uh, maybe you could share it with friends, family, or whomever you think may benefit from it. Uh, really helps us out, helps us meet new people. Uh, and also, if you're maybe know anyone or anyone out there that's interested, maybe a second opinion or uh, maybe just sitting down and taking a look at their at your current investment strategy, we're happy to do that. No, ob no obligation, no cost always. Just uh, you know, reach out to us. Uh, you can catch us at uh, info at canon-wealth.com. And with that, thank you, guys. We appreciate it. Thank everyone for joining us. Uh, good night. Be well. Stay safe.